to be honest, I'm not a huge hiker. That's what was kind of funny to find me at Eagle Creek. And I just brought my car key and left water and phone and everything in the car. And I was kind of celebrating that feeling of just being really light and unencumbered. I came to this part of the trail where I came upon a big group of people. And then there's this big view of the valley and you can see the steep sides all forested. I remember there were these girls to my left and then I remember these two boys to my right. One was really tall and one was pretty short and I saw the shorter one just lob something that was on fire and it was just sort of this casual overhand lob as we all just kind of leaned over and watched this thing just fall deep. Couldn't see where it landed. I think what I said was, do you realize how dangerous that is? There was just sort of this reaction from the girls behind me of like, ha <laughs> ha. And then they continued down the trail. And I remember just thinking, wow, that's crazy. But then I kept walking. And so I continued up another five minutes or less. Literally a voice in my head said, Liz, you would feel so stupid if that turned into a massive fire and you saw it happen and you got stuck. And I just turned around and started hauling down the mountain. Very quickly, I came upon the spot and what had been a trail of smoke was now 20 to 30 feet wide of billowing smoke. And so I just started running down the trail and I was very scared and I'm on this really narrow trail and now I'm having to run down it. That's the thing about that weekend. The five of us hadn't been together in months and months and months. I mean, we had a variety of things planned, but one of them was this short afternoon hike on a beautiful, hot summer afternoon. One day I was just sitting at home and it was almost the end of summer. We had a group message going at the time, and so I texted that. I said, hey, does anybody want to get together and go on this cool hike up in the gorge? A day hike, nothing too major. And so we got like 10 of us together. This it was, was just like a last birthday. minute hike. And I was like, oh, I'll, I'll just go with my friends. This wasn't like for her birthday, but it was on, it was yeah. actually on her birthday though. I remember my dad not wanting me to go. So I just told him that we were going to Noah's house. And we kind of had this idea, oh, well, we don't really want to be on our phones the whole time. We have cameras anyways to take pictures. So let's just leave our phones in the car. We're like, oh, it's only a two mile hike, so I'll leave this huge water jug in the car too. And we just packed up our backpacks and started hiking. Got a little swim in and then sort of, you know, laced up our boots and then started hiking down. And our son, Teddy, was ahead of us with the dog, Ralph. And um, suddenly he came sprinting back um, at about the one mile mark saying, you know, the hill's on fire, the trail's impassable, we gotta go back. And I was, you know, being the dad, I was in control. I said, no, 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 I'll, I'll go take a look. I thought like, well, you know, we can probably jump it. And Teddy just grabbed me and said, no, you're turning around. And he was like freaked out. And so I thought, oh, okay, I can respect that kind of fear. You could hear it long before you got actually to it. And it, you could just hear this crumbling and this rumbling. And we turned this corner and we're just hit with a wall of heat. And so we were all this huge mismatched group of people, about 140 of us, hanging around, like waiting for something to happen because it was clear that there was this fire down there, but we also knew that there was the fire above us at Indian Creek. And um, from the look of it, we were trapped on both ends. 
finally I got to the bottom where it's like you come down the trail and you can see, oh, there's the water. It's only like a 10, 13 foot drop. I'm safe. And I just started hauling through the parking lot and very quickly came to this massive SUV of Forest Service. And he immediately went on the radio and called in that there was a fire. And then he got out of the truck and he's like, okay, so tell me your story. Maybe five or 10 minutes had gone by and I was feeling uncomfortable because I knew those kids could have gotten into the cars and just driven off. And I really wanted the kids to be held accountable for what happened because I could see that they really had no connection with their actions and what was happening. And this minivan went by and I watched the girl in the front seat of the car and I did not recognize her face, but um, there was just something about the whole vibe that I was like, I think that's them. And he said, you, are you comfortable getting in the car with me? And I said, yes. And we're now sirens chasing this minivan who then takes off. And I remember like, just thinking, I feel like I'm in a movie. Like, this is crazy. The state police came and they were interviewing the kids. They just looked like they were hanging out at like the shopping mall, just completely chilling. We're watching all of this happening and there's this massive disconnect. And I also felt this, you know, this tremendous weight of like, these kids are busted for this massive thing. And that felt very heavy to me too, because I knew what a big deal this was, whether they knew it or not. We are tracking breaking news tonight. A wildfire burning in the Columbia River Gorge. 140 hikers are essentially trapped and will have to spend the night hoping for the best. What a sight this is behind us. In the hours we've been out here covering this fire, it is no doubt growing. Take a look, a true hell on earth, almost apocalyptic looking. Embers are still flying, heavy ash raining down for miles. And as you can see right there, entire cliff sides engulfed in flames. It had been a really hot, dry summer. There had been a lot of fuel building up because of a very wet spring. And then it was day after day of temperatures in the 90s. All it takes is one spark to ignite the forest. This map is the fire progression of the Eagle Creek fire. Fire started here on Eagle Creek, and it went over this ridge uh, overnight and down towards Cascade Locks. Day two is this darker purple, and then day three is this lighter purple here. The fire was difficult to put out for a couple of reasons. One, it was on very steep terrain. Much of it burned within a wilderness area where there are no roads. And then also the policy is within the backcountry and wild areas. Again, fire is a part of forest ecology. Where they concentrated their efforts is around population centers. Cascade Locks is a teeny tiny little fishing town that used to be a lumber town, but now our business and our livelihoods rely on tourism, obviously, the hiking, the trails, and things like that. Columbia River Gorge is just a beautiful scenic area full of mountains, full of wildlife. People come here to hike, to bike, to camp, to sightsee, and I think most people that come here wind up staying. The night of the fire, um, I walked outside to the backyard of the restaurant here. And I looked up and I saw this big gigantic smoke plume and I thought, oh crap. So I watched it for a few minutes and I came inside and I told my, all of my employees, I said, hey, here's the deal, I think there's a fire, let's get ready. We were told um, that they were recommending a level three evacuation. And what level three means is get out now. Um, so there's three levels uh, of fire evacuation. There's level one, which is get ready, level two, get set, level three, go. And we were at go before we even had a chance to do one or two. Um, that's how quickly this was evolving. If the devil had fingers that extended, that's what it looked like. It look, literally looked like fingers just running, like fire fingers running down the mountain. And it, at one point it was traveling so fast, we just watched it just crawl right down the mountain in several different spots. So at that point, 
just about everybody went home, except for me. And I called my husband and I said, here's the deal, I'm gonna stay. I've got my truck parked in the handicapped spot out there. If this thing is gonna go up, I'm gonna watch it. To me, this place is really everything. Um, I put six years of, oh dang it, six years of blood, sweat, and tears into it. So it's my home. This is my, this is my everything. Sorry. The way the fire was coming and the smoke that had once been the yellow curtain was now like a vast sort of boiling black and reddish and angry looking wall of, you know, smoke. Uh, and it was getting closer. At one point, helicopters from the Indian Creek fire started fluttering down and dumping water. A smaller helicopter came and fluttered over us and then took off and then came back and dropped a note. And it said, uh, we see you stay put extreme da you know, danger or something. We're in this huge group of random strangers and people, and we all kind of started talking, and are we gonna have to hike out of this? Are we gonna have to spend the night here? How are we gonna get enough food? How are we gonna get enough water? Nobody really had any answers. If Rob hadn't been there, um, I hate to even think about that. Rob happened to sit next to us on the beach of Punchbowl Falls, and eventually it came out that he had been a technical sergeant in the Air Force and had you know come back recently from a couple tours in Afghanistan. And so when I heard that, just joking around, I said, "Well, Jesus, you, you should be telling us what to do here. Take control. You know, it's a battle." Uh, and he laughed. I mean, it was intended just as a joke. But then later he told me, "I knew you were joking, but that actually was a sort of a catalytic moment." And so Robbie got up on the rock and introduced himself and explained what was going on and where things stood and said, I think it's time for us to go and we're all gonna make it out alive and the way we're gonna do that is we're sticking together. When we got to the top of the trail to start hiking out, there's people numbering off, people with like pen and paper. So I said, okay, 129, what's up? We had established some phone contact with uh, some people in the group and pretty shortly into the, the hike out of the drainage um, towards the intended destination for the evening, we lost communication. There were only two ways out. One of them we knew was blocked by fire, and that was the new Eagle Creek fire. The second was going up the Eagle Creek Trail past the point where it had been closed as a result of the, the Indian Creek fire that was heading eastward rapidly. Our only hope was that it hadn't crossed the trail yet. We had really good communication. Like if somebody needed like a med kit or like a map or something, one person would say it and the person behind them would say it. And so you would just hear map, 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 all the way down the line of people until somebody had it and then they would just pass it along the line of people up to the front. I think it was a lot of making jokes and singing songs and just pushing each other to keep going. We kind of thought of it as like a group sleepover. Yeah, or like we were all on Survivor. <laughs> Those hippies were behind, right behind us with their guitars and their sandals and their didgeridoo. The women from OSU showed up in, they were wearing bikinis and like running shoes. Like I don't think they even had a shirt or, or you know, maybe they had towels or something. But they were in extraordinarily unprepared. I left everything in the car. I left my bag, my towel, my water bottle, because I was just thinking of swimming. It was really hot. When we got up by the hem of the fire, uh, we sat down and, and the sky was red above us and, and flaming embers were raining down around us and starting spot fires on the, on, you know, on the riverbank. And one really started going and um, one of the hippies, bless his beaded soul, hopped across the river and with a, like a thing of water and put it out and then did this thing of like digging into the dirt where the fire was and making sure there were no embers. Because as it turns out, this guy was, had, been, had had a summer job with the Forest Service fighting fires. 
So guess what? You know, he knew exactly what to do. I think that was the scariest part because we felt like it could spread and come towards us and we didn't really have anywhere to go. Mm -hmm. I remember that at that point, that's when the mood kind of changed. People realized, oh crap, like, this is huge. We don't have food, we don't have water, people were worried. I think we left Punchbowl Falls at about six. So we had like a couple hours of light and then it began to get dark. And so we were kind of hiking by flashlight at that point. This was just before we got to uh, Tunnel Falls. The highest and most dangerous of all the the sections of the trail that go just right on the face of the cliff. Part of the trail goes behind the waterfall, and so it's constantly wet and slippery. You're just hiking on this narrow trail with a cable right here. You're holding on to that, and there's just this tight cutoff and just blackness below you. And there's a waterfall in front of us, and so you just see that falling into an abyss. Everybody had those phones, and walking into this smoky canyon, it was like this procession into a cathedral because this light was so glowing and so just these little balls of light coming up, you know, in this long train of people, one after the other, after the other, after the other. You couldn't really see the people, but you could see their dots of light going all the way up this little canyon. And the whole time you could hear the didgeridoo just going like, wah, 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 and you're like, whoa. <laughs> like, that was an insane feeling. It was surreal. And it was like this weird sort of haunting moment of beauty right there, you know, on the edge of, you know, <laughs> on the edge of the cliff. You know, we finally pushed past it, and we walked just a little farther, like maybe a mile or so, and everybody just found a place to, a little patch of ground to lie down in. We just, Shut like, up, cuddled <laughs> and tried to stay as warm as possible. We didn't really sleep at all, though. I think that all hit us at the same moment of, like, realizing that we were going to spend the night, and they weren't gonna give us a phone to like contact our parents. You know, so we just had to lie down in a lump and try to kind of preserve whatever warmth that we could. And, you know, but lying in the dirt without a pad or anything underneath you, you know, you suddenly become acquainted with how many rocks there can be. The first night I spent the night in my truck. By morning, I realized that it might actually be not savable. So I went home, I took a shower, sitting on my couch, and my cell phone rang, and it was Kim Brigham, and I answered the phone, and she said, what you doing? I said, well, clearly I'm not opening the restaurant today, Kim. Like, what do you think I'm doing? I'm sitting on my couch, feeling sorry for myself. She's like, well, we have a lot of hungry firefighters in town. She's like, so I'm gonna go make some chowder and serve it up. She's like, so I'm gonna ask you one more time, what are you doing today, Shelly? I said, well, clearly, Kim, I'm coming out to make pizzas for hungry firefighters, right? Because that's what we do. And she's like, OK, I'll see you in a bit. We were, take, were going to take ice up to make sure they had cold water. Drove up to the, to the fire station. I pulled into a parking spot that was open, and I saw something move. I realized that it was somebody sleeping. So I turned off my lights, and I looked, and I scanned. And there was dozens of them just like sleeping on the fire station lawn because they didn't have anywhere to sleep. And I just started crying. I was like, this is crazy. We got to do something to help these guys. Anything to help these guys. People that weren't evacuated or even were and heard that our vehicles were outside showed up at the back door and knocked on the door and said, what can we do to help? What do you need? Anything. I think everybody's feeling was kind of the same as mine, just like, this is it. We're going to have nothing to come home to. It looked like we were going to be annihilated. It looked like the fire was going to take us over. It looked like it was being swallowed by the pits of hell. The second day, we woke up and everything looked like there's just this heavy fog. And so we breathed in and realized there was all this heavy smoke. And so we just walked and walked and walked. And it was kind of hard to figure out how much farther there was to go because every time we bumped into another forest person, we'd say, how much farther? They would give us like wildly different answers. And eventually you get to this Watum Lake and you walk up this huge case of stairs and it's called the Stairway to Heaven, which is like a little too cute. It was an emotional reunion. Oh my gosh, it's such a relief. I mean, like, everyone's prayer has been answered. He spent the night in the forest with more than 150 others pouring out of shuttle buses after getting trapped on the trail. It was long. 
and tiresome, and we were running out of water and food. So we kind of just helped each other. If somebody didn't have water, we'd provide it for them. Or if somebody didn't have food, we'd help out. One of the things I did when I got back is you know, I had these hiking shoes, and uh, they were so filthy and covered with ash, and so I hosed them down really good, and I put them on the back steps to dry overnight. And when I came back down, you know, saw them the next morning, they were covered in ash again because the, the smoke and everything from the fire had was moving west, sort of moving toward us. And so it was kind of like that fire is still after us. You know, it's like you couldn't get away from it. Oregon is burning. All of Oregon is burning. It's all burning. Flames tearing through the trees, thick smoke blanketing the gorge. These are the surreal images of the Eagle Creek fire tonight. That blaze inches towards a town evacuating. The families who rushed out in the middle of the night can only watch with faces as grim as the sky, waiting for a glimpse of hope. At the peak of the fire, there were over a thousand firefighters making sure that brush was cleared, that were back burning areas, that were monitoring fire activities. Cascade Locks is right here. Uh, this kind of patch of white. And there's a black line right here that indicates the fire line and the back burn that was created around Cascade Locks to protect it. And it came down all the way to Bridalville, so roughly 22 to 24 miles of burn. You know, what ultimately stopped this fire was Mother Nature. It was kind of luck uh, with, with weather, and we got some pretty major rain that came in um, and really stopped this fire in its tracks. It's a little bit of a misunderstanding that the fire was 49,000 acres. That just describes the perimeter. It really burned in a mosaic pattern. So within that 49,000 acres, more than half of it, 55% of it, is intact forest today. The Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area, it's, you know, think of Yellowstone National Park, think of Yosemite National Park, Mount Rushmore. It's on the level of those national treasures that we've worked so hard for over a hundred years to protect. Things that make the Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area stand apart is the long history of human habitation here with Native American tribes going back more than 10,000 years. This river is called Etchewana, Nichewana, Waimo, and Wana. We are the salmon people. Waikanushpum means the salmon people. There were more salmon here than any river on the North American continent. My parents did it, and so that's just what we do. We go out on the boat. It was my dad, myself. <sighs> Shelly and I, when I could, were feeding the firefighters, and I was still trying to fish, but the fishing was just kind of, it was during the peak of the season, and I, they kind of stopped. There was ash falling on the river and debris. I cannot praise those firefighters enough. We were lucky. It was a quarter mile from town, and there were no lives lost, no houses lost for Cascade Locks. This was the closest town that it came to, really. I mean, this was the, this was the town that was evacuated first. Um, so people in this town were really angry. Investigators do say they know who started the fire. They claim it's a 15-year-old boy who was lighting fireworks on the Eagle Creek Trail. And tonight, we talked with a woman who witnessed what she says the boy did. If I'm not mistaken, the headline said, teens giggled as you know they lobbed the firecracker. And it's like, well, I never said they giggled. The way that it was written about was like, well, wait, you're, you're painting a picture like these kids were like malicious. They were just clueless. There's a big difference. Then it no longer became my story. And what I started seeing was that it became this incredible monster. Just thinking about the teenager who was accused of starting the fire with a firework is enough to make tempers flare. Oh, oh are you is. kidding me? There's so many headhunters out. There was concern for the safety of the teen and his family because of threats made against him on social media. They include comments such as, fry them up, 
throw them in the fire and other things we can't say on TV. You know, I had local media knocking on my door to film me and I was like, no. They didn't care that they were totally getting the city bonkers. The city went bonkers. We all did. They were feeding like this anger that we were all feeling like I had felt angry. I ran down the trail. But then I saw like, oh wait, you guys want to kill these kids? Like literally you think they should pay for the rest of their lives? You think their families should be bankrupt? What? It's like, who hasn't done stupid stuff? I do stupid stuff every day. And who hasn't been really dumb when they were 16? Every 16 year old. $36.6 million. That's the amount a judge in Hood River County determined that a 15 year old who started the Eagle Creek fire will have to pay. It weighs on me, you know, what's happened to these kids. This one kid, you know, like this, the fine that's been imposed, like how can anyone pay something like that? I could not have responded any differently than I did. This is just my personality. I couldn't have done it. I was compelled to do all the things I did. But um, it doesn't come without a great weight, you know, that it's like this kid, you know, his life is now forever altered, um, not just because of the action that he took, but because of my action too. And that's, that's a huge weight. We can't really judge anybody in our way and blame anybody. It just must have been uh, the way of the Creator to allow it to happen. Fires are a natural part of forest ecosystems. Fires and forest uh, have been together for millions, hundreds of millions of years, really. We burned all the forests and the valleys from time to time. These fires were usually put there so that there would be new huckleberry bushes and they come in fast. Forests have become very resilient to fires. There are certain species that would not exist but for fires. There are some species, for example, of pine trees whose seeds won't even open up unless they're exposed to a fire. It really only dawned on me later of how close we came to having our whole family just wiped off the planet. It brings up all these kind of scary existential feelings when you realize exactly how casual things were right up until that moment. But that's how it is. I mean, you never know. One minute everything's great, the next minute, you know, you're on the edge of existence. Sense of community spirit here, I think I realized for the very first time during the fire. It made me proud to be here. It made me proud to be a member of this city, of this town of Cascade Locks. Just a few weeks later, we went to Hawaii because my nephew was getting married out there. The music was playing and people were dancing. And at one point, they put on uh, Jimmy Buffett's cover of Van Morrison's Brown Eyed Girl. So the five of us were just in this close circle dancing like maniacs to this shitty cover <laughs> of a worn out song. It was like a transcendent moment. It's like we had ascended to this very safe, <laughs> not the least bit on fire. And it was like, yeah, we did that. We got through that, and here we are, just, you know, carelessly, cheerfully dancing together. <laughs>